Welcome everyone to the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. This is episode number 68. I am Tortuga Power. You can call me Eric. I'm joined by my co-host, Matt, the historical gamer. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. And today we have a very special guest along with us, Youper, who I've actually done a podcast with before. Uh, first, how are you doing, Youper? I'm doing very good, man. Thanks. You and I, we used to run this the Strategy Gamer podcast for a while. That was actually my first podcasting experience. It's what got me hooked. Been chasing the dragon ever since. Um, but I I know of your Something Awful. Is the Hired Goons from Something Awful? It is, right? Yeah, that's correct. It's founded and foundered. <laughs> well, why don't you just introduce yourself? Tell um, Tell the audience where they might know you from. Uh, yeah, my biggest, uh, I guess, claim to fame is The Hired Goons, which was a fictional Let's Play where everybody voted on a mercenary group, and then I played out the missions inside of Command Modern Operations. At uh, one time, we had a couple of hundred voting members, and it turned into spreadsheets and lots of comedy. It was it was good fun. That sounds awesome. It was. It's kind of like one of those like user um, input series that you see. I mean, I've seen those from like Aurora 4X and all that where, you know, you take time in between your videos to like incorporate user feedback. Yeah. I mean, it's great for people who are following because they're really involved in the series. I feel like some people kind of done some of that on your Rule the Waves series, Tortuga. I know at least I had people trying to do it on our collaboration series when we were doing a little bit of role playing with it. Yeah, they. Uh, I think that's a good... It's a good one for people to role play because you it's it's a pretty natural environment for it. You can get your ship name in the game and then the people who have their ship name, they role play as the captain of that ship. Um, and this is kind of it's been a self you know propagating thing where the content, the role playing has gone up in quality and now we have one person who basically writes like a book. I'm serious, it's it's better than some books I've read that were sold for entertainment. So it's, it's quite high, it's very high quality, but yeah, it's it's fun, and I think that you probably did. You have any of that, Uber, in yours? People role playing at all? Oh, absolutely. Probably one of the biggest things people enjoyed is they could claim a pilot slot, and I would name all of the aircraft that were in the missions for people, and some people got really involved with it. It was really cool. Yeah, it's pretty rewarding as a content creator to put that out and see people investing themselves in it. Well, anyways, should we start off with what we've been doing lately? Um, Matt, why don't we go with you first? What have you been playing? Yeah, so I've been playing a couple of games. I would say the the biggest um, time sink at the moment is probably still War on the Sea, uh, which I think we need to talk about at at some point. But uh, it's a real-time strategy, or I guess real-time tactical uh, war game and strategy game that looks at the South Pacific uh, campaign, specifically the Battle of Guadalcanal, and has a very Task Force 1942 vibe, that old game from Microprose. Basically, you are either in command of the uh, Allied forces, principally the Americans, but I believe there's some Australian ships in there as well, uh, and the uh, Jap- or the Japanese forces during the uh, Operation Watchtower, so basically August of 42 and early 43, And your objective is to take Guadalcanal and a couple of the nearby islands, build up an airfield, and assert your dominance in the South Pacific. Uh, You have a grand strategy map where units move around, uh, and when they collide, then you go into a tactical map where you can fight battles in real time uh, on a 3D uh, map with air combat, naval combat, uh, submarine, you know, is included. Um, and, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a game with a fair bit of, you know, a fair number of warts, I would say. And yet I've still played more than 70 hours of it already, which, um, you know, goes to show you that I'm obviously still enjoying it and playing it quite a bit. Um, in addition to war on the sea, I'm trying to think I, you know, we, we just had a kid, so I haven't been playing a lot of games lately. Um, I would say that I just got a copy for uh, Combat Mission Cold War, so I'm looking to jump into that, but I haven't had a chance to play it yet. Um, and then I've had my eyes on a game that's uh, that's coming out. We're recording this on 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 the ninth. A game that's coming out tomorrow. Um, that looks like it's a first person shooter with like a single player campaign based on the German invasion of Poland from the Polish perspective. Um, and so that game is is really interesting looking to me. I think it's what Land of War. I think is the name of the game. Um, and so I would say there's more games that I'm kind of keeping my eye on. Rather than uh, rather than playing right now, um, but that that's kind of where I'm at right now. 
Well, I have been playing War on the Sea as well. I don't know why that title is always hard for me to get out. I keep thinking it's, I mean, there's so many different titles like War in the Pacific and anyway. So I'm not going to talk much more about that because you've kind of covered it. I've also been playing a lot of it. I think it's a good game with a lot of flaws. You know, some things that, one of the things that strikes me about that game often is how there's just like one madman developer behind this trying to, to like make the game work. Uh, because sometimes you, it's, I think it's very easy for me to suspend my disbelief basically about that, to imagine that this is a title worked on by many people. Uh, so that's that's to the game's credit. I think the art looks good. And I, you know, it's building upon the previous games, Cold Waters, etc. Uh, other games I've been playing, Shadow Empire. Boy, this one is not going to go away. I just, uh, it's one of the rare games that I play in my spare time when I'm not recording. Uh, but I'm also trying to finish a series on that. And then last but not least, of course, Rule the Waves. So I'm doing Rule the Waves again. And uh, boy, I mean, talk about a game with warts. I guess sometimes that game just frustrates the hell out of me. But that's uh, that's neither here nor there. We'll do another episode on Rule the Waves one day. But uh, Uber, what have you been playing lately? Or what do you have your eyes on? Yeah, I got uh, pretty much three games. Uh, been playing Valheim with the family just as kind of a way to break up the day and run around and beat up trolls. Uh, The other one has been uh, Command Modern Operations, the new Kashmir Fire uh, campaign pack that released. I've really enjoyed playing the kind of garbage planes, not the top tier F-35s, but, you know, the Pakistani jets and the Chinese fighters and all the kind of weirdo stuff that sends you to Wikipedia to follow a rabbit hole to understand what you actually have. I have a weird fascination with the JF-17, by the way. Uh, that Pakistani Chinese fighter that's like, a, I think, a poor man's F-16. Oh, yeah. Those things are, I mean, it's just, it's awesome because you have no references as to what to expect. Is is it an F-16? Is it an F-18? Is it just a flying dumpster fire? I mean, you just don't know what you're getting with, and that's what makes it so much fun. How approachable are those scenarios, by the way? Like, I've played Command a fair bit, but not recently, and I think... I've always been intimidated by the really large scenarios that kind of, um, I just don't think I'm good enough at the game to do more than just utterly fail at them. Does that, like, I know the, the sands of war or whatnot, the one that looked at the Israeli conflicts that tended to kind of be more of a easy, easier way in. Some of the initial scenarios were fairly small. How's, how's the cashmere DLC? Yeah, so far, uh, I've been enjoying the Kashmir. I, I don't do the monster scenarios either. I just don't find it fun to micromanage a thousand different air units and ships and subs. So the the very first Kashmir fire starts you out. And it's, it's really approachable, and you can zoom through it and smash units around real quick. But just like anything, you get kind of rewarded if you do really take the time to dig into the capabilities and the terrain and all that. But it, it, it's been fun. It's a good, it's a nice upgrade to the engine. So it's good to see them moving forward with it. Awesome. I'll have to check that out. And the last game is just uh, Crusader Kings 3. Just kind of plugging away at uh, enjoying that game. That's kind of my sit back and relax, scan, scan the news and just play CK3. Do you have like a kingdom or a duchy or a count, you know, that you always, that you play as most of the time? Yeah, I either do Newbie Island of Ireland or Scotland or England. I I, I enjoy when I can kind of just go on family mode and not so much the Thunderdome of Europe. So it, it's it's more of a relaxing game than it is paint the whole map. Yeah, that's, I mean, when I, I really enjoy that game. And usually, and, and this dates back to CK2, usually when I played that game, I would always play as Georgia, which is kind of like living on the edge because you're smack dab between Byzantium and, and the um, Arab uh, uh, caliphates or, or kingdoms sort of coming out of the Middle East. But it's also, you don't have, you're really not trying to build up too massive of an empire because you just you really can't um, in that position, at least not without like really using the game system sort of in a way that I think wouldn't be intended. Um, so I really, I enjoy it because it's challenging, but I also I have no desire to turn that game into a map painter. Yeah, it breaks down. I think once you get multiple empire titles, it just it's it's just not as much fun anymore. That's always been my problem with that game. Is just the way I play things. I typically try to paint the map, and um, I did play one multiplayer series. And speaking of multiplayer, maybe maybe the three of us should get a multiplayer get that going. But I played one with Wolfpack and Finish, and uh, just when you start goofing around, (laughs) Paradox games, I feel like they're 
Um, usually pretty good in multiplayer, but CK3 was a lot of fun. Uh, just even like pretending to plot against other people and all that. And there's a lot of potential multiplayer interactions there. Like you don't have to be at war or allied with somebody to be sending your spy over to look at them or, you know, trying to seduce somebody from the court. So there's always something you can do. It's nice interactive. I'm really looking forward, as I'm sure a lot of people are, to the newly announced Victoria 3. But I'm really curious how they're going to kind of thread the needle of uh, like some of, uh, I think, the the core elements that people enjoy about some of the more storytelling side of things of their more recent games um, with, you know, the typical Empire map map painter. They're claiming the game's not going to be intended as a map painter, which I don't know how you do imperialism without that. But um, it'll be really interesting to see how they approach that. As long as it's not another Imperator, I'll enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. That, that I think it will be very interesting to see how how Victoria Three is received because I don't think I've seen a game of theirs with more anticipation. Like they waited so long, it's got such a cult following. I just don't know how you know it. It, it to some extent feels like you know or. Is it possible for them to do to 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 please everyone? Because I think the cult following around that game is probably largely from before Paradox became the company that they are now. And so I wonder I wonder how that'll all go. But that'll be that's a topic for another episode. Uh, but I'm gonna get my two cents in anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't think I think it's impossible. Vicky th- Vicky two was honestly it was like one of the most uh, like geeky or I don't know the right word intense analytical based ones of their uh, previous titles I would put it up kind of on the same level as like Hearts Fire and 3 but it required like the most micromanagement and knowledge of the game and all that investment to learn so I think that moving from that to any of their games in recent history it's just going to disappoint a lot of the original fans I mean there's I don't think there's any way to please both parties like the new Paradox fans and the ones of yesteryear who used to play Arts of Iron 3. My, my gut says you're right, but what I would counter with is I thought that was true for CK3. Um, you know, CK2 had such a good reception, and I think CK3 had really high expectations, especially it was coming on the heels of Imperador, and, you know, that did tremendously well. Now, CK2 wasn't quite the micromanagey kind of, I don't think the appeal of CK has ever been the same as what Victoria yeah, was. It. But it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I think that you nailed it. It's it's just different. Like CK two is was built originally itself as a storyteller. Um, so yeah, it, it was a lot easier for them, I think, to transition to. Uh, a, I mean, CK two was probably their breakthrough title, wasn't it? The one that was like the most popular. Yeah, I mean that and, and EU four. I think between the two, I think CK two CK two probably brought them out into the mainstream a little bit more because there were a bunch of. Like there was a big Game of Thrones mod that came out and that was when Game of Thrones was sort of at the peak of its popularity. So I think you saw them break a little bit more into the mainstream than they typically did. Um, But I think both EU4 and CK2 had similar levels of success in terms of sales and things like that. But that was really when they kind of started getting big. Like that was when Paradox sort of threw off the shackles of uh, of being a little bit more of a of a niche uh, company and, and became, you know, a company that would sell a million plus copies of their games regularly. Rest in peace. <laughs> anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, you know, we were trading messages, you were back and forth um, when some news came out about Game Labs, uh, the developer of the Ultimate General, Ultimate Admiral series. Um, and, you know, I thought it would be great to have you on to kind of talk a little bit about that because uh, Game Labs uh, has been acquired in a pretty big, you know, in a pretty big sale, I think the total value, the total potential value is like 60 million. Although I think the initial payment is 30. Um, and they've been acquired by a company called still front, uh, is it still front games. Yeah. Still front, uh, group, sorry, still front group, which is a very large company. Um, they're larger than paradox. Uh, and they are a company that almost exclusively focuses in mobile games, which is interesting. Um, But I thought we had some, uh, you had some interesting thoughts. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to have you on. Uh, Thank you for coming on. And uh, that's kind of the news here that we're, we're here to talk about today. The acquisition of game labs uh, by still front groups group. 
And I think it probably makes sense to kind of talk a little bit about game labs in sort of a, you know, what are they, you know, what have they done? What's worked for them? What hasn't worked for them? Um, and then we can kind of talk about maybe how this acquisition may play out because I think it has a fair number of people, at least myself anyway, a little bit uneasy about the future. Um, but Game Labs is a company that kind of broke out, what was it, what, 2014, 2015? Uh, with Ultimate General Gettysburg. That was their first game. Uh, the game designer behind that was the uh, individual who was sort of spearheading the Darth Mod projects. Uh, Nick Tomatis, I believe, is his name. And um, that was a game that had a lot in common with uh, Sid Meier's Gettysburg uh, from back in the day. Uh, sort of the Battle of Gettysburg with a lot of branching scenarios, a fair bit of sort of dynamism in terms of the way the battle could unfold, bringing units forward battle to battle, and fighting out the Battle of Gettysburg sort of in a bunch of sort of bite-sized, real-time uh, battles. And I think you were a pretty big fan of that, weren't you, Uper? I actually, no, I, I, I did not play it until just recently. I kind of was more of the Ultimate Admiral side of things. I always saw it, kind of watched it, but never really got into it until recently. Um, well, uh, I know, Tortuga, you've been following the Ultimate Admiral side of things. So, I mean, they released Ultimate General. That was a fairly big success. Then they did Ultimate General Civil War, which was a much sort of bigger campaign, but less focus on the individual battles. And then I don't really know what happened to Game Labs. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say Ultimate General Civil War was less focused on the individual battle? Yeah. Oh, you mean just it wasn't focused on Gettysburg, right? Well, it wasn't focused. On, so, like, Gettysburg was 20 scenarios or 30 scenarios, right, for one battle. Well, I mean, it was only, I think, like, seven or eight in a row, but they had different options for whether, I think, like, forking branches if you won or lost in the earlier battles or did did well or did poorly. Yes, but it was much more focused in sur- sort of, like, we're going to really hone in on this one particular tactical battle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the title was Ultimate General Gettysburg, and it only did Gettysburg. Right. And there was no building of units between battles. There was no, um, you know, anything like that. But Ultimate General Civil War said, all right, we're going to take a look at like 30 or 40 different Civil War battles, and we're going to give you an army management option where you can upgrade units or uh, equip them or buy reinforcements or things like that. And then you're going to play in a fairly lin- well, a very linear campaign uh, from the start of the Civil War to the conclusion uh, where your units kind of level up almost in like a Panzer Corps style of, of game uh, where you, you kind of carry your force forward. Sometimes there's units that aren't in your core, but generally speaking, you bring your units forward through every battle. Um, and then, uh, and that game was very, I think that was more, su- I think that game was more successful than Gettysburg. It was uh, pretty popular. And then they announced a bunch of games. Um, by the way, when did sea power come in all of this or na- naval power, naval power, sorry. <laughs> sorry, naval action. That was, I believe that came out or that sort of was in development in parallel with ultimate general civil war. Okay. Cause that. We should also mention that since that was, um, you know, you talked about some of the successes, but I would say that that was not one of their successes. Yeah. So I kind of feel like somewhere between Ultimate General Gettysburg and Civil War, they kind of, maybe they had, I don't know if the success was like to the point where they were like, we're going to do everything under the sun. But like right around the time that Ultimate General Civil War came out, they were working on naval action, which is kind of like a, like a, um, I don't even know how to describe it, like a player versus environment, but also player versus world. Kind of felt like it was trying to be like Eve in the Caribbean um, with naval combat in the Age of Sail. Uh, I never really got into it very much, but like it was this game that was had a very contentious development, a very long development. It was in early access forever. Um, it, there was definitely a fair bit of tension within the user base about the direction the game went as opposed to what they thought it was going to go when it first entered early access. And then I think at some point it launched officially. And, and and then you ended up having ultimate general civil war coming out. And, and within the span of, I feel like a few months of ultimate general civil war, like officially releasing, they announced ultimate admiral age of sail, ultimate admiral dreadnoughts, this war or this land is my land. Um, Apparently, they're sort of under the under the the hood, working on a Ultimate General Revolution or American Revolution game. 
they've got another Age of Sail game that they're working on that's like more grand strategy. They're doing a lot, and they only have 30 employees. So, yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it seems like at some point someone was like, we're going to do every idea that we have under the sun. And that's led to maybe some analysis paralysis or a fair bit of elongated development on some of these games. And Tortuga, I don't know if you want to dive in a little bit or... Actually, I, I think, you Bert, you said you were following the Ultimate Admiral stuff, so do you want to... You know, maybe give your take on probably Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought, right? I'm guessing that's the one that most of us were looking most at. Age of Sail almost flew under the radar, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Dreadnought was one of those games that looked initially like Rule the Waves, but with better graphics and, you know, just kind of a more polished version. Sorry, and by gra- better graphics, you mean it, it would have graphics, right? Yeah, it it got went beyond Excel 1998 and actually had a you know a user interface that was a little more polished than Windows 3.1, but it was a uh, you know it, it kind of came in and like did the early access thing and I bought into it and it looked great and I mean it it was cool I mean you got to mash some dreadnoughts together and it was kind of like a a bunch of tutorials strung together and then that was kind of it things got real quiet and. Then they'd leak a little bit, and then it would go quiet, and they'd leak a little bit. And, you know, I kind of never really knew, like, was more coming? Was this abandoned where? Like, like what was going on? It, it just felt like it was just kind of floating adrift. And not only that, but we had a, a brief glimpse of the campaign. And when they first launched, by accident, you could unlock the developer mode. And I, I played it for, like, an, a 30 minutes, and it fumbled around and crashed and all that. I mean, you clearly weren't supposed to have access to it, but just by some... Some glitch in the matrix you were able to. Uh, and then that's all that people talked about was, right, when is the campaign coming? And it still is all people talk about <laughs> some three years later. How, how long has it been? Two years? I don't know. Oh, at least. It, at least something like that. And I agree. I mean, I'm, I want to play it for a campaign that fixes kind of the issues with Rule of the Waves and gives you a better slate to conquer the world. And it just doesn't feel like it's ever going to come. Like it's just one more release away from a tidbit of something. The campaign is the patch of tomorrow and it always will be. (laughs) I was going to say, like, I think it was originally this, that the campaign was going to be in the first half of 2020. Then they said, all right, guys, it's official. I don't think they said it's official, but they said end of 2020, the campaign's going to be there. Didn't materialize first patch of 2021 campaign is going to be there and they've done like three patches since then and i think in the last patch they were like all right the next patch is going to be the campaign it's like really when is that coming because i think 2019 is when the game first entered it's kind of like a closed early access right you can't buy it on steam yet but you have to buy it directly through game labs website um, but you yeah. can you can get access to it via that. You got to buy it through some wonky website that feels very groggy. Like you know, you don't know if your credit card's really going to get stolen or what's going to happen. But yeah, you did get access, and they've kind of used that carrot on a stick with the campaign to kind of keep everybody from rioting in the streets. Well, and it's like it's an interesting. You know, I think the rule of the waves. My gut tells me someone in their in their company played the rule rule the waves and like this is a really awesome game. But to your point, Uber, like, there's no real graphics. It's a spreadsheet game. And they were like, let's do our, our version of this, but but with graphics. Um, and, uh, you know, you're right. Playing the game, it looks cool. It looks good from a, from a gameplay perspective, but there's only so far you can go. Like, the game right now is, they have, I think, 56 different currently, and they've added a bunch since it first came out, but they've got, like, 56 different academy missions, if you will. And basically what that is is, like, You need to sink this enemy formation or this enemy ship, and you have certain restrictions around what you can design to do that. So go design your ship and then fight the battle. So it's kind of like a design challenge, if you will. And then they've got a a custom battle option where you can design, you can set up custom battles uh, between different ships, anywhere between 1900 and 1940, where I think you can design one of the ships and it just throws you into a 3D, you know, kind of sandboxy kind of a battle. And that's it. Like, the game feels very blah. You know, it looks cool, but very blah without a campaign. And I, I think I think what everyone expected the custom battles and the the um, missions to be is just like a test bench, really, for balancing the campaign and such, or as training missions. 
I, I didn't really realize when I first started playing that that was going to be the focus of the game for so long. I mean, everyone's waiting for the campaign, right? And I, I never thought that those missions were anything beyond that, just as a, like a prep for the campaign. That, that's one thing that surprised me. But we also probably should mention that they had some developer issues along the way. The reason why the campaign didn't get put out right away is because the person who was originally working on it in the first year or so um, left the team. And I don't know if what the official reason was. Um, there's some debate, you know, as, uh, as gossipers like to do. <laughs> People are debating whether or not he left or was fired. But that's what... Um, so there is a reason why the... It's not like the developer has just been scratching his head for a long time. But they probably had to just either shovel someone else's code onto some poor new person or have them build it from scratch again. Yeah, I, I think that... You're exactly right. They had some post in 2020 at some point where they're basically like, we have to take a pause because we had some turnover in our developer side. Now, I think it's worth mentioning the designer of this game is Nick Tomata. So he is the designer of the ultimate general games, um, but he hasn't he didn't like do naval action or, or all of the game lab games. I think a lot of people conflate Nick with all of game labs, um, but he is the designer behind this. And so it's kind of interesting because the development of the Ultimate General games was relatively smooth, uh, but but this one they've obviously run into a, a fair bit of, of challenges. And I would agree with you, like the Academy missions and the custom battle, to me it always felt like this is your little sandbox to go test out some design ideas, but like really, the or, or maybe in the Academy missions, like this is the tutorial, um, but they just kept adding to that and they never, <laughs> the campaign was just, you know, vaporware and I don't... I don't think the game holds together without a campaign. I mean, like, that's the whole selling point of it. Yeah, it's just a really good tech demo. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a question, though. Who? So, Matt, I know you played Age of Sail. Um, I don't even know how this all worked because they're... Uh, is Age of Sail supposed to be just borrowing assets from their original naval action? And by the way, I, I just want to mention, we talked about success failure. I believe that um, Ultimate General Civil War, is that on Steam? Yes, Ultimate General yeah. Gettysburg and Civil War are both on Steam. And I think that those are pretty highly ra rated, but Naval Action has uh, is a mixed reviews, and we all know that mixed is usually not a title that you're going to enjoy. And even recent review reviews on Naval Action are at fi around 50% mark for Steam. So they had this mixed success because it's like they had really good Gettysburg, really good, really good Civil War, um, bad Naval Action... Then they had Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought, which I guess I'm putting before um, Age of Sail, but Age of Sail, did it get started afterwards? And actually, Matt, I don't know if you want to talk about this at all, but you actually enjoyed it. I didn't really as much, so we have conflicting viewpoints on the game. But did, I, I have this sense that it started, either it flew under the radar and it was de started development first, or it actually started development after Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts and uh, finished before it. I'm not sure which one started first, like it because it's weird. Like the Ultimate General Revolutions game is supposedly being developed, but hasn't really officially been announced. Um, I believe Age we, of Sail was announced after Dreadnoughts. And did we already mention uh, the controversial "This Land Is My Land"? No. Okay, so I don't know. You, have you heard of this game? This Land Is My Land. Yeah, I did. I thought it at first. It sounded like pretty interesting and then there seemed to be a lot of controversy with an eastern european company making a game based on the american west so i kind of stowed away a little bit with the stick and kind of waited to see what happened but yeah there's controversy there yeah and this land is my land is uh i don't even i haven't played it so it's hard for me to like give a real firm opinion on it but basically you're like a chief of some i think a fictional tribe um, in the American West that's being encroached upon by, um, you know, uh, settlers, if you will. And, uh, you kind of have to fight back and try to, try to, you know, protect your tribe and, and maybe get a little bit of revenge, I think is, is somewhat of the game, but it's also, I think it's a little bit of a stealth game too. Um, but again, I haven't really played it a whole lot. It did get a fair bit of criticism. You know, it's an Eastern European developer developing a game about, uh, you know, first nations or, uh, or native tribes in the Americas without any consultation of, of actual native American tribes. 
And I guess some folks tried to reach out to them and tried to give them some input and asked to be involved. Uh, and they basically just sort of shoo shooed them away. Um, and, uh, you know, gave them platitudes saying like, yeah, of course we're doing our research. We're, we're looking into this, but like, you know, I don't, I don't know that they ever had any real interest in, in making the game other than the game they decided to make, which I don't think is unique to this game, by the way. So I think that would be a similar criticism, although perhaps less um, sensitively around naval action as well, which was a game where there was a lot of desire for community feedback and a lot of desire for folks to kind of help shape the way the game developed. And every time folks kind of gave criticism during early access or gave some thoughts, um, they kind of were just sort of either ignored or told to shut up or, I mean, there's, there's videos on, uh, on YouTube about, um, like them banning people or whatnot. And, and just, I don't know, I wasn't really super involved there, but it, it seems like they may at times, depending on the game they're developing, have some tone deaf approach to, to the way they manage their relations with their, their, uh, their fans. The way I see it is the games, which Nick, uh, Thamidis or however you say his name the, the ones that he's involved in I, I kind of like trust are good and I don't know where this sense comes from uh, just maybe I don't know I, I kind of like his story even the fact that he, he used to be it, it was Darth Mod right for the original Total War Rome Total War but it just to, to hit this modder who obviously therefore has a passion for games because he's making mods without getting paid for it and then he goes off into his ultimate general uh Gettysburg. So I, I don't know. I, I kind of like trust the titles that he's involved with, which is why it's a little bit strange to me that Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought hasn't done well. And I assume that they just got like a bad apple of a developer uh, and they're working their way through that problem now. Man, I should have volunteered myself. I, I feel like you can't do it. It can't be that hard to write a better campaign than Rule the Waves, which just has there's like 10 sea zones in the whole world and, you know, random battle generation. Just, I just get the one. sense that sometimes they announce their projects too soon. You know, like they're still really in early development. I remember I had some chats with the, um, I think the designer of Ultimate Admiral Age of Sail when that game was first announced. And at first it was like, all right, to me it was like, this is going to be a, a game that's like Talonsoft Age of Sail back in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And you really want to lean in heavily to Age of Sail combat and 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 whatnot. And then sort of over time, it became like, uh, all right, what are you trying to do here? Like, is this ultimate general or is this ultimate admiral? And they really started, at least initially anyway, it felt like they were really leaning heavily into the land combat at times. And, and I had some discussions with the designer. And, and to me, it felt like they were just, they were really looking for what's going to work. And I don't know that they had a super clear vision. I actually think ultimate admiral Age of Sail ended up turning out pretty good um i'm not a huge fan of the land combat but the game's core is still about naval combat and i think that's very well done there's not a lot of games about the age of sail in naval combat um you know in modern modern senses i can't really think of many games since the age of sail games back with sort of talent soft days in the early 2000s that have, have tackled that era outside of like games like port royal or pirates which really aren't about naval combat um but I do get the sense that sometimes maybe they announce things when it's kind of a little bit bare bones and kind of figure it out along the way. Uh, I think Nick probably had a much clearer sense of what he wanted with the ultimate general games. And that's probably why they turned out, you know, pretty, pretty well. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just get the sense that maybe sometimes they're a little bit too aggressive in announcing their titles or covering, you know, just, I mean, they're a company of 30 people. And they have how many games in development? They just finished Age of Sail. They've got Dreadnoughts. They've got This Land is My Land, which is still early access. Um, they have an, another Revolution. Age of Sail game, Revolutions, Ultimate General. Like, that's a lot of games for 30 people to be working on. And even if they outsource some of their work, like, that's still a lot. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, it, it kind of felt like they had to throw a pot of spaghetti at the wall and let's see what sticks, which I mean is great. And maybe that is kind of, you see what generates the most buzz and then you devote developer resources based on that. And it kind of felt like the age of sale one, like I think it would have been better served if it would have been age of sale, say Trafalgar, where they would have focused like real tight, like they did with Gettysburg. You know, let me really lean into this one particular era rather than just this real broad brushstroke. 
but as time went on it just like this land is my land that's the kind of game that you know ea could be making and they could have you know 500 developers on it would still have a hard time with it so it really felt like they were biting off more than they could chew but uh i guess you know whatever works for them and i mean somebody came up with a big payday like you said with stillfront which we'll be getting into in a sec here so stillfront group is a company that i think they're about like in terms of revenue they're about like 50 percent bigger than paradox they've got over three billion dollars in, in valuation um, quite a few employees, quite a few more than Paradox. And it's a company that it seems like all they do is acquire other companies. Like it's almost like it's a, it's a, a holding company of some kind where they just go out and they buy different game developers. But all of the game developers they bought so far, with the exception of Game Labs, are mobile developers like if you look at if you go to their website stillfront groups and you look at their uh the games that they they publish or make or whatever um you've got call of war which is like one of those games you always see when you're scrolling through facebook ads if if any of you don't block that already um you've got uh, oh my goodness. Uh, just everything. I mean, there's war and peace, which is like a civil war game that again, you see on, on Facebook, you've got word nut, which I assume is like a words with friends type game. Um, but like, these are all mobile games or they're all like browser based games. And, and even if you dive into like, you know, if you go to the, the section on their website where it asks like about us, it's a, you know, the, about us. Stillfront is a free-to-play powerhouse of gaming studios. Uh, our diverse and exciting game portfolio has two common themes, loyal users and long life cycle games. And they reference, like, games as a service everywhere. So it's very interesting that a company like Stillfront, which is a publicly traded company and has, you know, they're also they're based out of Sweden, so... um you know, they're also just like Paradox. They're based out of Sweden. But, you know, they're a multi-million dollar, many more than that company with, with lots in revenue. Um, I always struggle to do the conversion because everything's in Swedish krona, which is like, okay. So I, that's not a great exchange rate to the dollar. But but it's just a weird kind of acquisition to me because I think they've done like one MMO, um, PC-based MMO, but everything else is like mobile and and, you know, pay to pay to play type stuff um, or, or, you know, pay to win type stuff. So, you know, they make the argument that they buy companies and then they let those companies develop whatever they want to develop and they don't interfere, but then like they've made very strategic decisions to buy mobile stuff and game labs is the first company to not, uh, not fit into that mold. Well, do you think that this could be a benefit? Cause I think most people look at this news and at least I did it this way. I think most people, think it's a negative thing like oh my gosh what's gonna happen with game labs and i know that the the pr side of things i think nick posted something about because people obviously ask like well what's happening to ultimate animal dreadnoughts is it just gonna get canned or is this maybe the cash injection you need in order to finish the game of course the pr side of from uad is yeah this is the cash injection we need now we can finish no problems i mean i'm sure that's what they're they're saying it's the normal sales pitch but is it possible that there's actually truth in that, though, or that this, uh, I don't know, could kind of, like, is it possible that Game Labs can continue to make good games without falling under the fold of the mobile games as a service umbrella? Is it possible that we could get that? I don't see it, but I'm trying to look at the, if for any kind of silver lining here. I guess I, that my question, I guess, would be you for what, what do you, what's your thought on this? Like, I think I feel like you've got a pretty good sense of uh, developers and, and what might be going on here. I'm curious to think what, what your thoughts are on this acquisition and what it means for the future of Game Labs. You know, I have a hunch that there was probably somebody at Stillfront, some analyst that said, all right, we need to diversify. And what's the best way that we can do this? And they looked around. They probably had a connection. And somebody said this fits our niche or something we want to diversify into and otherwise i mean like you said their focus is on the you know the 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 pay to play it's free but you pay and buy gems and you know i don't want to call it predatory but that style of game i mean 
Game Labs doesn't make anything like that. So somebody there is either an enthusi enthusiast or thought they had an opportunity. And I think Game Labs, as long as they are profitable and they make money, will probably be left alone. But as soon as somebody has a bad quarter and says, where's our money? Then the finance people are going to step in and say, all right, it's time for things to change. We need a return on our investment. It's uh, the business side. I have a feeling with this organization is really going to determine the freedom that these companies are allowed to have in their development cycle. If they're profitable, I think they'll get a pat on the back and they'll get more resources. And if they're not, then they're going to go the route of uh, the Facebook ads and, you know, cheesy graphics. Well, and it's, it's worth, I think that's a great call out because one of the things that really struck out, you know, stuck out to me when I saw the announcement was they didn't sell a portion of their company, right? Like Paradox at one point, I think Tencent purchased shares in Paradox before they were publicly owned, but it was a minority stake. They didn't, they didn't have a controlling interest. Stillfront bought 100%. The press release makes this very clear. They bought 100% of Game Labs. So, you know, the founders of Game Labs don't really have the ability to like push back and be like, no, this is our vision. This is what we're going to do. They're totally owned by Stillfront now. So if if the business folks come in and say something, they don't really have a choice. Oh, um, you're, you're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. I also thought it was kind of interesting because in the release, I mean, they did give some some, you know, indication of what what their um expecting in terms of success they also did mention games as a service and the ceo of game labs kind of mentioned like now we're going to be able to do things we didn't ever think we'd be able to do which is like i don't know if that means like oh we're gonna we're gonna lean into mobile because game game labs um ultimate general gettysburg was on ios for what it's worth um but it was it was i think it was basically like the full computer version or very similar um certainly didn't fit into into stillfront's model um, but I thought it was kind of interesting because they did also make the point that all the existing game labs, you know, the, the, all the senior managers, all of the, all of the ownership group, that'll all stay the same. They'll all still be involved. Um, they've got some pretty lucrative payout options depending on the company's performance. Uh, I think the initial acquisition is 32 million us dollars, but then they can earn another 30 mil million depending on how the company performs over the next three years. Wasn't, wasn't 8 million of it or so like in cash too, which means it's just, that's just going directly to the people. Uh, so thirty-two million, uh, twenty million of it is cash, and t uh, roughly it's like nine point seven million uh, is in a, a million newly issued shares. So they're they're giving them shares in Stillfront for part of that acquisition. So it kind of gives them a vested interest to be like, make sure we do well because if the company does well, then you do well, right? I mean, twenty million. Okay, obviously it's not being split evenly, but among three uh 30 people that's a pretty so i'm thinking if things do go poorly maybe they've still given these like people like nick maybe they've given them the kind of like a blank canvas and the money to create their own games even if they end up leaving still front that's just a lot of money right well it might not be equal equity either i mean you might have one guy that owned all the shares and then 29 employees so i don't I don't know if you can really equate, you know, that full value to divide it between 30 people. Oh, I'm sure yeah. it's not all 30, but uh, I would, I, my guess is I think there were like two co-founders, so they probably have the bulk of that. Um, but I would, I mean, I don't know. Every company is different. I would kind of expect Nick or, or the other senior designers who are sort of heading up their games probably were given an equity stake in the company as, as sort of a way to lure them in. Um, that's at least that's typical practice with like startups is, you know, your, your initial couple of key employees are going to get something in terms of equity well before you ever even think about like selling out or anything like that. Okay. I'd like, I'd like to imagine it in a world where, you know, everyone in the company does have some payout from this because I'd like to think about this one guy working on ultimate Admiral dreadnoughts campaign who leaves only to miss out on some hundreds of thousands of dollars like a year later that's what keeps me going is knowing that this guy's out there after sabotaging the game and he missed an opportunity i mean a lot of startups you know, issue issue shares in lieu of payment for what it's worth i mean that's not an uncommon when you don't have a lot of money as a company one way you lure people in sometimes is like hey if we ever go public you'll get this but 
I think Uper's right. It's probably very heavy, you know, top heavy in terms of the, the, the return. I'm sorry, were you starting to say something, Uper? Oh, I was just saying that uh, Eric had some good schadenfreude there feeling for that uh, developer. <laughs> I, I wish him nothing but the best, but I sure wish we had a campaign. Um, in the Stillfront press release of the sale, they did say that, or the purchase, they said the financial assumptions in 2021 is based on forecasts for the acquisition and expected growth, which is fueled by a planned early access release in the last quarter of 2021. So I don't know if that means like, ulti- I would to me, that's probably Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts because it's not on Steam yet. So like, yeah, they've got some sales, but probably not a ton um, because it's, you know, it's not really all that front and center. Um, they also say they're expecting to generate revenue of 70 to 80 million Swedish krona um, this year from Game Labs. So that would be, if we do a conversion... It's about one eighth. <clears throat> so that would be like almost 10 million US dollars in revenue with about half that being profit. I mean, those are pretty, I don't know, for these type of games, that feels like that's kind of a lot. Um, I'm sure like Ultimate Admiral Get- or Ultimate General Gettysburg or Civil War, I'm sure they probably did something like that. But I don't know. I mean, if Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought's campaign doesn't kick ass, I, I I don't know. That that could be they could be very quickly into that situation that you were talking about, Uper, where someone's coming in and being like, "All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna shake these things up a little bit. We need to figure out a way to to start performing a bit." The interesting thing I will say though is like naval action does feel like the kind of game that that, that would fit in the still front. Like that game feels like it's made to be like a World of Warships almost type of deal, where you sell individual ships, and they already do that to some extent. So like that one might make sense where you would you would kind of have a little bit more of a pay to play or pay or pay to win type uh, model, but nothing else that they've made. So there there's a fair bit of pressure on them pretty quickly to deliver some pretty big sales figures this year. It's funny you mentioned naval action because if you go to Stillfront Group and you look at their featured games, that's the only one from Game Labs which is on their list is naval action. And yeah, I think that that is exactly the kind of game they're they're looking for, um, especially because that's it seems like the kind of title, or even something similar to it that could very easily transition to mobile. You know, you're just moving your ship around, firing broadsides. Well, even if you um, don't transition MMO. it to mobile, it's the kind of game that could be again uh, buy ship models. You know, World of Warships. Like maybe they're just maybe they that's a model they're looking to do and and it might be pc based but it could still generate a lot of revenue a big part of this too is i mean the big focus on stillfront is kind of the alternative gaming you know you know niche i guess you can call it we're used to picking up games you know from matrix or gog or steam where stillfront i mean they're marketing to people that you know you and i would not think of as traditional gamers you know your aunt who's playing a good game studio building up some restaurant or a word game or something like that. So if they can enter into this niche for them, that's all, you know, new territory and fresh earnings. So it potentially it fits into what they want, but I don't know if it fits into what we want. Yeah. I mean, that's a great call out too, because like still friends, a big company, it's a multi-billion dollar company in terms of its valuation. And I had never heard of them. Like I had seen some of their games scrolling through Facebook, but like mobile gaming, Facebook gaming, I think a lot of folks tend to look at that as like, oh, well, that's not real gaming or whatever. Well, there's a lot of money in those in those segments. These are big companies who have quite a bit of, uh, of success, but to your point, Uper, they really haven't tried to cross that bridge into the more traditional, if you will, PC gaming space. And maybe this is their attempt to do that. So that's that's what I kind of like am looking for as far as like a silver lining goes or some benefit. So if this cash ends up being an injection back into like traditional war games, then I do think that there is potential for it to serve our interest. As in, I, I know that Still French just basically wants to vacuum up from a new revenue source. But if, if it also means that Game Labs is able to grow or generate new games then I will be happy with that. So that I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would say I'm a big fan of it because I'm not sure that that's how it'll play out. And I think that it probably would have played out better for me without the acquisition. But 
that's the silver lining. I'm I'm holding on. I'm holding out hope here. Yeah, I mean, um, I I'm nervous because part of me wonders if this is just like Game Labs massively overextended themselves with all these projects in flight. And they kind of needed a bailout. And it was kind of like, all right. And then they could also make a big chunk of change just to like get out from under their their overextension. Um, but yeah, I think I'm kind of where you are, Tortuga. I, I hope this helps them do what they've been doing, but do a better job of delivering products timely. I it's just a little bit concerning because I don't I mean, you you're really plugged into the to the gaming space. How often do we see a new game developer come out and, and like a new game developer that appeals to a larger audience come out and start making war slash strategy games that are well received by a pretty large audience. Like game labs was kind of, you know, when they came out in 2014, 2015, it was like, Oh wow. You know, when was the last time we saw a studio come out here and start making kind of mainstream strategy games that are good games and could help expand the niche, right? We, I mean, it's it's kind of been Matrix slash Slytherin for, and, and to a lesser extent, Paradox, and that's about it. And maybe the like one C stuff, but um, there's not a lot out there. And then they came out of kind of came out of nowhere, is developing some really good games, and now they're gone, sort of. Yeah, I mean, I'll totally agree with that, man. It they did come out of nowhere, and I remember seeing it, and it's like it's eye catching. It, it's easy to play. I mean, you look at it and it's so incredibly different. I mean, look at the age odd game, Civil War 2. I mean, if there is a more dense game for Civil War buffs, I mean, there's just not a lot out there. And I mean, you look at the game and it looks good. And I would totally agree. Until the slate of developers that came on with Microprose, there just wasn't a lot that was good looking, that looks to play well. I mean, Matrix, yeah, they got some great titles, but they got some real turds, too. Well, and they also, my perception of of Matrix is just that, you know, they're around and they've been around and they'll probably continue to be around. But I don't know that I would ever expect them to expand the genre into a new generation of, of gamers. And it felt like Game Labs had the ability to build that bridge to get people interested in stuff that maybe they otherwise would never never look at yeah i think they had an opportunity to do a franchise i mean they could have branched out and just done that type of game that style of game kind of like the pike and shot guys did you can move this around to different eras you can put you know lipstick on this peg and you can march it all over history and people will play it and i think it really would have done well i really want to know why they made the decision to go to ultimate admiral rather than be like, Hey, you know, Napoleon would be the natural next step after civil war with a pretty big audience. Yeah. Can you imagine Waterloo? I mean, that would have been amazing. I mean, maybe that was in their long-term vision. I just, I kind of think they got a little bit like they lost a little bit of focus. I think the spaghetti comment you had earlier is sort of the prescient comment from this episode. But couldn't there also be a little bit of an, like a designer's perspective on this? Like maybe they, they had made two civil war games um, and Napoleon, although it's slightly different, would have been basically more of the same. I mean, that's what we're talking about, franchise, right? And maybe they wanted to just do something different for their own creative satisfa- satisfaction. Maybe. Uh, I, kinda, I could see that happening. Like, maybe the success of these games allowed them. I You hear this from some game designers who are like, oh, yeah, I want to do this, and I can't wait in the future for to not do this same thing again. I want to you know, get my creative juices flowing in some other project, or I've been thinking about, I, I'm sick of thinking about this exact scenario. Let me move to something else now. I'll buy it, but man, sometimes I just want more of a good thing. Yeah, no, but I think that's an interesting comment also, Tortuga, because Darth Mod had an Empire Total War mod, which, if you remember, Empire Total War had naval combat in the Age of Sail. So, like, maybe it was like, all right, so I've done, like, the linear land combat, like I want to, I want to try delving a little bit into the naval side of things because there is a bit of background in terms of his mods uh, being in games that cover that, that genre. But but that said, I think that now there's hopefully been enough time between the Civil War title and whatever else they're doing. Hopefully they do return to it because uh, that's certainly a time period that is. I mean, the only game that has covered this respectably, as far as I can bring to my memory, is is a Total War Napoleon. 
which I didn't, I don't even think that's, I mean, it has the, yeah, actually I'll say it. I, I think that's a pretty decent game for Napoleon because there's not a whole lot of games. You just have slim pickings during that time. Scourge of War Waterloo is about the only other modern option. There were some games back in the day, um, you know, Waterloo, Napoleon's Last Battle by Take-Two Interactive, uh, Austerlitz, Napoleon's Greatest Victory, which was sort of the sequel to that. Both of those games were built on the Sid Meier's Gettysburg engine. Um, but yeah, there's not there's not a lot out there, at least in terms of like real-time combat options. There's... I think there's some like more board gamey style games out there. Yeah, um, Tiller has a couple, I think. Oh yeah, John Tiller. Yeah, yeah. But that requires playing John Tiller games. Yeah, it's not quite on the same level as a uh, Ultimate General. But if you really need your fix for that, I mean, options are limited. Oh, I have one other question actually about the the progression of campaigns in this series because we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, you were starting to talk about how you know there's a, a very fixed focus on Gettysburg and then Civil War, they did this like linear playthrough, but you were able to start building your own troops. Um, then they, they followed the same campaign style for Age of Sail. And in that, I realized how much I liked that campaign style. So in my opinion, I think that's a, actually a great way to set up a good tactical game is put this like XCOM type shell on the outside where you get to equip troops and stuff like this in between missions. But I actually think this is a fantastic way to do um, a game. It doesn't give you as satisfying a feeling when you know that it's a linear progression, but I feel like especially if you're going to run into problems developing a strategic level campaign, it's still really satisfying. It still kind of scratches that strategic itch when it does give you this ability to at least customize the troops you're bringing into the battle. Um, But I'm curious to think, to see what, um, what you guys think about that. Like, this Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts thing, I mean, you can see that the, the campaign basically sunk the game or has so far has greatly uh, aggravated people by its absence. I don't know how they would have done a linear campaign for something like that, obviously, but for future games, I wouldn't mind them doing something like that Ultimate General Civil War thing for Napoleon or anything else. I love having an, an emotional investment in that one unit that just keeps surviving. I mean, I just, I always enjoy that. You know, you get attached to it. You play it a little bit differently to keep it alive. And I always, I think that's a good move on their part if they can keep with it. I like it. Um, I said I was on the uh, Three Moves Ahead episode that talked about uh, about this game. And I liked it in Ultimate Admiral Age of Sail. My criticism was that I felt like, you know, you build up this great naval order of battle with your sailors and then you get thrown into a land battle where you got to throw your sailors into a linear combat and you crack you know, ship of the line crew gets eviscerated because someone decided to send all 600 men ashore to fight against enemy, you know, fusiliers like that felt a little bit weird. I know what they're going for. They're going for like the Jack Aubrey, Horatio Hornblower. We're going to do an amphibious assault, but it, it felt a little bit odd to have like your entire crew wiped out in land combat battles. Cause I don't think it would kind of work out that way. But um, I enjoyed it in Ultimate Admiral Age of Sail. But you say that, Tortuga, and what they've shared so far on the Ultimate uh, General Revolutions game is it feels like they're going more Total war where it's going to be more move units around on a strategic map, less linear, and then when they fight, they fight. I think that that'll be very interesting, too. I mean, I love the Total War games. In my opinion, it would be fantastic if they can apply that successfully. The, dan- the, you know, the potential failure there is, I mean, look at this Grand Tactician, the Civil War, where it had really interesting, good tactical battles, but the game's still in early access, but the this Grand Campaign has been a, has been a flop as far as I know. I, have, I don't know if it's working yet. I haven't played it in six months or so, but it really trashed that whole game. And I feel like if you had just put something like an ultimate general civil war type, I mean, it's not as satisfying. Obviously you want to be able to go and rewrite the civil war. But if you give me an option between something like Grand Tactician, the civil war, which has a a very poor strategic layer, grandiose in its hopes and its dreams, but its implementation is just pretty poor. I'll take the better implementation of a, you know, otherwise a worse mechanic any day that's an interesting way to look at it man i guess i'd agree yeah i mean i guess we'll i guess we'll see part of me you know the interesting thing about going to the american revolution is i wonder if it's like 
a softball setup to Napoleon to do like the big game with the real time, you know, move units around on a strategic map and fight. But I actually think Napoleon would have worked a lot better in that linear campaign setup because he had so many different campaigns. You could really like you could really build your army up uh, and and manage it in a really interesting way through the the old setup that they had rather than, you know, this new this new grand sort of strategy approach. But it'll be interesting to see. I think, you know, at the end of the day, that could be the kind of project if they do delve into something like Napoleon where I could definitely see Stillfront being really interested. And who knows what they shared, right? Like, who knows what their roadmap is and what they shared with Stillfront in terms of here's what we want to do, but we need your help to do it. Um, you know, if, I think if if their initial games that launch with Stillfront come out and they do reasonably well, I could certainly see the suits in st- back in Stillfront's office being like, all right, we made a good decision. We're going to let them go ahead and do this thing, and we're going to bankroll some really big project to sort of replace Napoleon Total War, which is still sort of the, I feel like the game people go to play when they want to play Napoleonic grand strategy with tactical elements. You know, we're going to build the next game of that and we're going to bankroll it and it's going to be huge. Um, So I really hope their initial games are successful because I I do worry a little bit that if they're not, they're just going to get heaped into the dustbin and, and they're going to be, you know, it's going to be, all right, let's cut our losses and let's get what we can out of this studio rather than uh, rather than let's fund them and, and, and help them build bigger and better strategy games. But it'll be interesting. I will also add one other thing, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, Uper. I think you mentioned that um, that prior to my, the microprose companies or, or developers coming out and being announced, you know, Grant, Game Labs was the only developer that we'd really seen kind of come into the space to be a little bit more mainstreamy to be you know good looking games uh, from a new developer in the strategy space that we've seen in a long time microprose obviously has since uh, sort of re-emerged and they are working on a slate of games that i think are really interesting and encouraging looking but i guess the question i have to you is if economics are driving this acquisition by Stillfront. Does that bode ill for Microprose's prospects in terms of building good-looking strategy games? Is is the market there to fund games that are much more expensive than the typical game that, like, Matrix would release? Yeah, I, I think it's Microprose is going at a niche that I think is not terribly well-served. You know, there's a lot of content out there, but there's not a lot of high-level content. And if you look at something like Second Front, there's nothing else. There's a lot of games that look like it, but I have a feeling it's going to set a new bar. And if Microprose can do that with a couple of titles, then I think Stillfront is just not even a competitor on the same scale. They may operate in the same area, but I think they're kind of both going for really different niche. I mean, Microprose has an opportunity to really up the bar and hopefully really bring a new level of gameplay to this whole area. And if they can pull it off, it'll help Matrix make better games. It'll help Stillfront make better games. And ultimately, it's really going to benefit us, the the war gamers, in a big way. Well, I would. I hope that's true because I would really like to see, now that you guys have me thinking about it, I really want to see an Ultimate General Napoleon. <laughs> I think a lot of people do. I mean, when they were, they did some polls originally and they were like, what do you want us to do next? And Napoleon like won out massively. But I think you, I mean, that's a great summation of, of the optimistic view of maybe where we were going. You know, I hope, I hope that Matrix's titles are, or sorry, Microprose's titles are successful and it does sort of set the new bar. I think that's kind of what I was looking for originally out of game labs was like, this is going to spur innovation, maybe expand the market. And we'll see, and this will give other companies justifications, other companies like Slytherin to say like, well, wait a minute, we can, we can take a few more risks. We can invest a little bit more in these games. We can, we can make games that look a little bit better. We can raise that bar. Um, I hope the reason that Game Labs was acquired was not because of, you know, that not being the case, but rather other reasons. Yeah. And com- competition is always good too, right? If um, there's more players in the market, usually it's better for the consumer. Oh, absolutely. The more games we have to to complain about, the better. 
I think that's about all I have to say. I don't know if any of you want to have some closing comments. To say I'm all right. I think we've really covered the issue really well, and I'm excited to see what the future brings. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Uper, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. I know uh, we've chatted a few times in the past, and it's been it's great to have you have you on. We'll definitely. I think we all will. We'll be watching how this situation unfolds and. Uh, a little bit of optimism, but also a little bit of hesitancy. So we'll see how this, how how Game Labs moves forward. We'll see, will we ever get an Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought campaign, or will we be talking about this game three years from now and still wondering if it's ever coming? Um, and uh, until next time, for Tortuga, uh, Uper, and myself, this is Matt, the historical gamer, saying thank you for listening to another episode of the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. And until next time, we're out. Bye-bye.